What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Internal Leverage Podcast. I'm your host, Abraham Heisler. On today's episode, I speak with David O'Leary, who is a writer in Hollywood and creator of TV's Project Blue Book, an amazing show. And we speak all about his career, going from being an unknown writer to slugging it out in one of the toughest industries probably in the world and creating content, creating a a TV series that has been played all over, certainly the United States, but also all over the world. It's an amazing episode. Check it out. Thanks for having me. This is awesome, Abe. Abe and I have known each other a long, long time, everybody. So this is like, we were just talking about it. It's like coming full circle. I think I've known Abe since I was 14 years old. And I'm just Yeah, I remember. So cool. cool. Scrappy kid from Manhattan just wearing a bandana on his head running around New York City. <laughs> and here you That's are. Right. Yeah. And here we are. Here we are all these years later. It's so cool. It's so cool. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. And, and thanks to the uh, thanks to you for hosting and, and extra paranormal society as well. So, so I want to I want to talk a little bit about, you know, about that, the TV show Project Blue Book, and of course, anything else you're working on. Uh, and and then I want to also get into, you know, some of the sort of mindset habits and routines that that you implemented in your career, because, you know, we interviewed Chuck Hayward, who's also a screenwriter in uh, Hollywood last week. And, you know, it's it's a very difficult um, uh, what do you call, it? I guess, environment or industry to break into. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. It is. It is. And, I, I, and that, that's one of the things I'm so excited about. I think, you know, about talking with you, Abe, today is, is, is kind of delving into that. And I had to think about what are my own habits. Um, you know, I mean, I can give the brief, like my brief background, if you guys want first, and then and then kind of delve into some of my work habits and things I've learned along the way. Um, you know, I've had a lifelong interest both in the uh, kind of the paranormal, as Abe can attest. And uh and also just in film and TV and, and, you know, I always sort of had the dream. I mean, I think I started, I think I took a screenplay class in high school. Um, always sort of had the dream of like trying to pursue it, but like didn't really know anything about how the business works or anything like that. Um, so, uh, you know, I spent the first few years when I moved out to LA, just, you know, I, I, I kind of broke into the business as, from the inside, which I, which I recommend to a lot of people, uh, just in terms of, I think it's there, there's a lot of value to be had of just trying to get a foot in the door however you can. I mean, I was intern, I think, three different times, both in New York, where I'm from, and, and in Los Angeles, um, you know, kind of supplementing my income, uh, tutoring. Uh, I, I was trained to be an SAT tutor for Kaplan, which is like a test prep company. Um, and then I was an assistant three times at, at different production companies and studios. And then I actually was a, an executive uh, at, a, at three different places as well before uh, really in my late 20s kind of realizing that I wasn't living like authentically, that I like really wanted to be a writer and I, that had always been the case. And I was sort of lying to myself uh, that no, if, I, if I'm a development executive, that's going to be enough. And, but my, my problem was like part of my idea, part of my job was to give away ideas to writers and to meet with writers and to brainstorm. And I, I, I started to, to realize as I, as I kind of, I guess, grew up that I wanted to be on the other side of my meeting. I didn't want to give my ideas away. And I would hold on to my ideas like, oh, this is something I, maybe I'll write one day. Maybe, you know, maybe I'll do it one day. But like many writers or aspiring writers, I wasn't doing a lot of writing. Um, and so that, that building that muscle and building, you know, uh, you know, sort of, sort of becoming an artist and, 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 and really working that craft is something I can definitely speak to because I, I didn't complete my first screenplay until I was 26 or something like that. Like I would start things and not finish them. Um, and part of that just comes from, and I'm certainly happy to talk about the craft too and answer questions about the craft. I, I wasn't a big outliner at the time. I'm a huge outliner now. I don't even begin a script until I know exactly what I'm doing, almost beat by beat, really, honestly. Um, and that comes from my from my days of just not finishing anything and just being like, I'm just going to dive into the script and see where the script takes me. And where it, where it took, I mean, some people can write like that, but where it takes me is I would just veer off course and end up about 40 pages in in a dark hole. And I'd be like, I have no idea where I'm going. And 
Um, but yeah, eventually I did leave development and sort of um, I pivoted into uh, teaching, which was a, a immensely helpful for many, many reasons. Uh, you know, and we can talk about this too. I mean, number one, like one aspect of being a writer is is meetings, you know, and having to pitch your ideas and not being afraid to kind of speak in public. It's, there's a bit of a performance kind of actory aspect to it. And I was terrified of public speaking when I began teaching. I remember like the first day, just like, you know, being like so nauseated. Uh, like I thought I was gonna like almost have like a panic attack kind of a thing. And I know Abe teaches like, you know, breathing techniques and these are all things I like did not implement at the time. But, um, but, uh, you know, I think with time, teaching did two things. It, it, it eradicated my fear of public speaking for, for, for the most part. Uh, although I still, even before like a podcast like this, I'll still get like a little bit of like, okay, here we go. Here we go. Like, but, um, and then it also <clears throat> forced me to become a bit of a, it was a film school that I was teaching at. So it forced me to become a bit of a walking, talking screenplay textbook in a great way because it really had me then question, was I implementing the, the, the sort of tactics and methods I was teaching and how could I, how could I learn from myself and my class and honestly my students to apply the mistakes they were making or the, or the methods that I was trying to ingrain in them in myself. And I, I mean, I taught for seven years and uh, it was incredibly helpful for me to, and that was where I really built my craft. It was a weird thing. I was like a teacher and attending my own film grad, graduate school at the same time or something like that. Um, but I was super grateful for the experience. And then, you know, uh, you know, eventually, eventually things in writing started to happen for me, but it was, it was gradual. Right. Yeah. That's so that's beautiful. I, I mean, I love what you were saying about, you know, being on one side of giving ideas to writers and then realizing, wait a second, I want to be over there. Right. And, and not like yeah. falling victim or, tra or into that trap of maybe one day or who knows, or who, you know, I'm not good enough, but actually starting to work on your craft, right. Starting to develop it, put it into practice and taking those little steps, you know, to, to put yourself forward. And then eventually, you know, you started attracting some really great opportunities, specifically uh, project blue book. Would you say project blue book was really the project that, that sort of, you know, launched your career in a way? I think so. I mean, I, I, um, and thanks for saying that. Yeah. I mean, I absolutely, I encourage everybody, like anybody who wants to pursue, to pursue a creative passion. It's like, you just have to, you know, you just have to commit to doing that, commit to beginning. And then, and then, you know, start small. Like when I quit being a director of development at like Ball Hollow, which is like a pretty big company. Like I didn't really, I knew I wanted to be a writer, but like, I didn't really, again, I wasn't really writing. So it became like, okay, like, here we go. How do I do this? Like, what's going to be the first thing I write? And then, you know, doing it in small stages in terms of my career. Um, yeah. I mean, my background had been in movies. So I had had a little bit of success as a writer in movies. Um, I had, uh, you know, I had been, I had set up a spec at a, at a financier that I had written. I had been hired on an assignment to write something. So I was, you know, I, I was represented by that point. I had an agent and a manager, but I didn't have any like produced credits. Um, and, you know, in that time period, we all kind of watched as like movies, which is my first love and still is my first love. Uh, but we, you know, we watched as television really came into its own and all these great stories you know television it was just the explosion of sort of the the, the the golden age of television and I I had never had the benefit of of working not only for a production company that really did television but you know never working on a tv show so there were only really two paths for me I could either kind of completely start over at the bottom and and be like a, you know maybe get a job as like a like a production assistant or something like that or I could just pivot and write and write TV. And, and, and so I decided, all right, I'm going to, I'm just going to start writing pilots. And actually, and I, and I say this all the time, like, I mean, I, I've written many pilots since the project blue book was the first pilot I ever wrote. Um, and that came from sort of like, I, I think it came from a freedom. I think why I ended up working was it came from a freedom of me letting go of even the notion that I was going to sell it. Um, I was like, I just want to write something that speaks to my interests that I think can capture my voice 
and that I think could be a cool sample uh, that no one will probably make because it's period, it's got VFX, it's, it's, it's a rather expensive show to some degree. Although honestly, we actually ended up, I think, making it for a very reasonable amount of money uh, and really put all, left it all out there on the screen. Uh, and everybody involved did such an incredible job. But um, I think there was a freedom there that I was like, I'm just gonna write this I'm just going to write this really with the intention of, of launching my TV career as a sample, kind of get me in the door. And, um, and that's what the script did, you know, and that's what it did for a while. I mean, it took a little while to actually find a home for Blue Book. I know. And so, it, it, you know, in retrospect, it seems so obvious that like it's historical, it deals with UFOs. Like, you know, there's only one that, you know, there's really like one home that really feels right for that. And that would have been history considering their programming and considering their, 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 you know, what the types of shows that they do, but at the time they weren't, they weren't fully known yet as a, as a home for scripted TV. So it took a little time to figure that out. Right. But I remember, you know, but yeah, I just remember that uh, there was, it was one of the freest, freest things I ever wrote just because I wrote it from a place that I just wanted it to be a sample of my voice and, and nothing more. I didn't have any, I guess what I would have considered delusions that we would, that we would sell it, you know, um, and in fact, there were other things that I was working on in TV that I thought had a better shot. Um, That's so interesting. But, you know, it's, it's always like it that. It goes to show right? you, like, it's always like that. You just never know. I was you working on know. this other one that was that was like a graphic novel adaptation. So it had pre-existing IP. It had a big TV director attached. And that one became a sample that got me some really cool meetings. But it was Blue Book that actually went all the way. Yeah, I mean... I, and I've heard this story so many times, you know, especially because I work a lot with entrepreneurs and business owners and, you know, in entrepreneurship, it's like you get an idea, you think, okay, this is the one I'm going to go for it. And then it just peters out, right? It doesn't perform to the expectation. And then maybe you take on something else like, well, I got nothing else to do. Let me try this thing. And then that turns into like the next Uber, right? <laughs> it's, That's it's, it. It's, it's the craziest it's thing. Some it's the craziest thing. It, it even happens in the writer's room sometimes where somebody will say like, you know, uh, well, what if we did something like, I don't know, like the bad pitch is, and then the next thing they right. say is the thing. Is the it's thing. like the whole, sh it's like that the bad pitch is actually the brilliant idea that ends up on screen. Yeah. And it's, and it's so funny when that, when you kind of let go of uh, a certain level of, I guess, like pressure or self-expectation and just allow yourself to be like, well, like, what do I really want to do? Or like, what, you know, and just let it be a free thing and, and not, not hold any other attachment to it other than just like, well, let's just, I guess like, I remember with Blue Book, like, I remember it not selling for months and still having this sense of, but, you know, but getting a bunch of reads and getting a lot of meetings and it doing what I wanted it to do where people are like, yeah, we, you know, we really dig this, but doing a period UFO show is just not what we're in the business of, of doing. Um, but I remember still being like, you know what, I'm just so glad that I put it out there. I'm just so glad that I'm the one who wrote the like project blue book spec that like got read around town. It, it, like, it, it was almost like that was the victory for me. I remember just feeling that way. And I remember my, like my agent at the time, my, my agent at the time, who's still my agent, great guy being, um, calling me and being like, I, I wish I could tell you, uh, that we had found a home for it because I love I love the script. I wish I could tell you that we that we that we would sell it uh, that that we're going to sell it, but it, you know I, I I'm not sure that we will. And I remember thinking also even then like uh, you know he really put everything out on the line as well. And 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 in some respects I was sort of at peace with it. I was like, well, this got me in the door. This now I now I have a TV sample. Now let's let the let let the let the games begin and let's start building from there. And then about a week later he's like. A and &E, I, I met with A and E Studios. They're looking to do something in the 1950s. I sent them Project Blue Book. They really flipped for it. You won't believe this, but like, and this was around the time Zemeckis was coming on board to produce. Um, like, you won't believe this, but they think it would be great for Robert Zemeckis' company. Zemeckis' company, as you know, is already interested, and now they want to take that package into history. And I was like, oh my god! And then, you know, and, and, and it's one of those things where sort of the, you know, I think in this business. There's a lot, you gotta, you gotta really, you can, as a writer or an artist, you can control kind of the quality and the quantity of output that you create. And that takes discipline over time. You can't control what people are gonna like, the ripple effects after that, you really can't control. 
control it. And I think anybody who says they can is, is, is lying and you never really know. And I do think that there is a little bit of luck that, 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 that has to happen for some success to occur. But I think that the more times you go up at bat, like eventually you're going to swing, you know, you, if, if, if somebody throws, you know, 30, 125 mile per hour fastballs at me, I'm going to miss 29 times, but I will eventually, I will shut my eyes and like click once, but I've been up, but I'm up at bat, right. Each time. And so that's sort of the analogy I, I, I sometimes think of with this, with this business. Cause it's, it's, I don't know. I, I that's why I commend anybody who's able to work in it because it's, 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 I feel like you're pulling off a miracle almost every time because the, the decks are so stacked against you. But I think that that's true for many businesses yeah. of cre- creative entrepreneurship. That resiliency startup. mindset. I mean, it's, yeah. Resiliency, getting, that's right. You, you can get knocked down nine times, but if you get up 10, well, there you go. That's you're it. ahead of the game, right? That's it. That's and I'm always, and you know, for, yeah. I was just going to say, like, I, I'm always reminded uh, when I hear this type of story of, Brian Cranston, you know, the actor who played Walter White in Breaking Bad, who's probably one yeah. of the most memorable TV characters there are, uh, there is. And, you know, he has this story about he was he was going in for auditions. He wasn't booking anything like nobody was giving. He knew he had talent, but he wasn't booking gigs. Right. And he said, you know what? Forget this. Like, I'm tired of getting emotionally wrapped up in whether or not they're going to hire me. And I'm just going to go and do my thing and let go of the outcome. And he said the, the moment he started doing that, that's when he booked gigs. Big, uh, that's when he booked gigs and he eventually booked, you know, Malcolm in the Middle. And then from right. there, he got Breaking Bad. And now, you know, he's, he's an iconic, you know, he played an iconic character and, and, you know, he's got an incredible career. And the same thing with uh, Robert Rodriguez with El Mariachi, which was a film that he made for his friends and family. And then somehow it got picked up by, by Hollywood and then he's making Desperado, right? So, right. Yeah. I think it's so true. And I think sometimes it's, you got to go through the, the process of being really attached and a bunch of failure. And I certainly had a bunch of like close calls or maybes, or this person was going to, this director was maybe going to do something or whatever. And, you know, but there is a certain, when you, when you do give it up and you just sort of like, you're just like, I'm just going to, the only attachment I'm going to have is to the project and not to the outcome of the project. Right. Um, I think that, that that is when you probably do your best work. Um, and it's hard, it's, it's hard to constantly think that way, but I try to, I do try to, um, I try to do that now. I mean, I try to just focus on like, what would I want to see? You know, what, like, what's, what, what's gonna be the thing that speaks authentically to me about this? Like, what's, what's the thing that interests me the most about this? And then I, and then I just hope that like, you know, what I find the most interesting is what other people will find interesting too. And sometimes I'm wrong, you know, sometimes like, sometimes it's like, I'll get the note and then just happens all the time. Like, or my agent will be like, listen, this is really interesting and really heady, but I think for, for it to be kind of consumed by the masses, we need to simplify it in some ways, or we need to like keep these ideas, but you've got to make it more accessible. I know that that's something I'm constantly, it is for me a, stru- a, a struggle of just like, don't be so cerebral or so into the, 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 the minutia of the concept and all those different cool ideas. You have to remember that like t- TV and film, these are character driven medi- mediums. You gotta, you know, you gotta spend as much time on the characters and the, and the vessels through which we explore these cool and interesting I- ideas as you do on the, on these cool ideas themselves. Right. Exactly. And it's the same thing in the entrepreneurial community. It's like, you know, we have a tendency to get in love with our, our mechanism, our process, our, our, you know, our product, whatever it is that we're putting out there. But we have to remind ourselves that the rest of the world might not be in love with it as much as we are. Right. And so we really have right. to ask ourselves, wait a second, is this what people actually really want? Right. Yes. So, totally. so that, that being said, aliens, tell us about <laughs> aliens and your fascination with the, the extra paranormal. Yeah. I mean, I've had, a, I've had a lifelong interest in the paranormal for sure. UFOs was probably my first paranormal interest. And I, I don't know why. I don't know why I've always been interested in this, to be honest. Like, I, I, like, I remember watching E.T. As a, as a little kid and I would leave. I didn't eat Reese's Pieces, but I ate M&M's and I would put, M&M, I put M&M's on the ninth floor of my apartment 
uh, in New York City. Um, I, I, I got exposed to uh, some sort of more like, not scary UFO literature, but I guess sort of scary. Like I read Communion, which is a, which is a tale of, of a man basically, you know, for the UFO enthusiasts out there, uh, you know, of, a, of, of an alleged abduction, uh, probably when I was like 10 years old. I saw the movie in theaters and that movie came out with Christopher Walken in 1989. And I remember I, I dragged my father to go see that movie at some small theater downtown where like the screen was like the size of a TV. And like, I just, I just was sort of always interested in this. I mean, like if you go back, like it's, it's cool. Like for me, it is such a culmination that I got to do a UFO television show because I'm not kidding. Like if you go back and look at my like high school, like notebooks, it's filled and Abel will appreciate this filled with graffiti and it's filled with like UFO. I would draw like UFOs and UFO caricature, like characters of graffiti. And I just was always interested in this stuff. I would be the guy at the party who'd like, you know, had a few drinks and would talk about UFOs. And, and I actually have some and video of so, that. <laughs> I'm sure you do, man. I'm sure you do. And like, so it, it, I definitely, I definitely, uh, you know, I watched all the documentaries and all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I'm, I'm a believer in it. Uh, I do think, and I think that everything we're seeing now in the news, the U.S., the UFO task force, all those A-tip videos that have come out over the last couple of years, those, those fighter jet dash cam videos that people have seen. Um, the fact that, you know, I mean, it, it, it goes on and on. I mean, there's so many different uh, sort of things that seem to be happening now that seem to point towards the, the notion that, the the, mo the the you know the, the the most powerful military on the planet recognizes that there are things in the skies that maneuver and behave intelligently that fly over military bases that that uh, evade uh, our, our 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 fastest fighter jets um, that we don't understand and I think it's very very unlikely that it is a foreign intelligence uh, you know uh, technology at this point because um, this stuff has been going on since the at least at least the late 1940s. Um, it is for me, I mean, what always fascinated me about UFOs also is the multitude of theories about UFOs, right? I mean, certainly there is the extraterrestrial hypothesis, which, which Project Blue Book, the show, I think, uh, leans into. Um, although, like, we definitely had some, some ambitions down the line had we been picked up for a third season. Uh, we were we had a room for a third season, but we didn't get picked up for a third season. Uh, to 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 potentially push the envelope on what on 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 exploring some of the other theories of what these what these UFOs might might turn out to be, whether they are uh, you know interdimensional human beings in the future and UFOs are time machines. Um, I mean, some people have incorporated UFOs into the simulation argument that we you know that we are in a simulation of some kind and they are the the game masters interacting with the game sphere. I always quite, kind of quite like that one. Um, but, you know, and all that kind of stuff was even brought up when I had to pitch this series to history. I remember, I remember saying, like, I remember thinking in my head, I said the word simulated reality to the head of the, of the, like the, the chief, chief person in that meeting, just so she understood that we may pull back multiple layers of like what this stuff could be, even if we ultimately end up back in a sort of an extraterrestrial um, landscape, which is probably the most, probable but you never know i don't know it all it all depends on like the nature of our reality and heineck wow. you know and i and i will shut up in a second, but heineck, heineck had a great quote that dr j allen heineck about ufos and i'm paraphrasing it and i certainly don't know it by heart but it was essentially that to understand the mystery of ufos we would under he, he believed that, that if we could understand that we may we may in turn understand a deeper truth about the nature of reality and i think that that is absolutely correct i think that whether it's just that like we're one of many living species in the universe or whether it connects in a far more uh kind of even you know weird way where it's like we don't really understand the true nature of our reality uh you know there's there, you know it's, it, it's fascinating stuff man I, I, I would have loved to have just been a fly on the wall in the writer's room on that show and just <laughs> just hear some of the conversations that were taking place. I'm sure it must have been incredibly stimulating. So fun. So fun. It was one of those things where, I mean, I remember just driving to, to the office 
both seasons and just being like, this is so cool. Like today, you know, and one of the great things was we got to really, we, we would pick every week we do a different case and do kind of a deep dive into that case. So we would do a lot of research. Um, and, you know, listen, like I'm the first to say, like, did we take liberties? Like hundred percent. Did we have to dramatize things? Absolutely. We were a scripted television series. We never pretended to be a documentary. We tried to act, in fact, draw a line in the sand by being like, after the show, and this was something I had pitched out at the very beginning when we did history. I was like, we should do something where it's like to learn more about the real life case that inspired this week's episode of Blue Book, you know, some sort of after the show thing that would then give you the facts. And then, you know, and we would take liberties with those facts because in television, you got to like, you got to thrust your, your, your lead characters into the extraordinary, right? So it's like, you got to put Heineck Heineck's got to witness the love, the Lubbock light. He's got, you know, like all this kind of stuff that, we, which, we, you know, which didn't really happen. Otherwise, we're doing a show about, about people studying UFO reports. And that's, that's difficult to do. You're, you're, you know, right. they're showing up yeah. after the fact and stuff right. like that. And, and we would do that anyway, but then, you know, the spookiness would continue essentially. Right. Um, but it was, it was, yeah, I mean, it was a pure joy. And what was cool is different writers on the show brought different perspectives. I mean, our showrunner, uh, Sean Jablonski, who's a dear friend, uh, was is, is like me in terms of his deep interest, lifelong interest in UFOs. But other people, uh, it was a newer territory for them, and they brought a, 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 a different kind of lens through which to view this stuff. And I think that was important because it reminded us that, like, you know, half this country, 49, 50 percent of people believe that some UFOs represent something that we don't, you know, something that a, a, some sort of shift in the paradigm of our understanding of science that we need to address. And then half the people in this country don't think that and think that UFOs are explainable in some sort of way. Um, and we have to remember that we were trying to service both, both, both audiences. So we wanted to make sure that we didn't just fill our room with like a bunch of UFO believers, but I would say our, you know, anybody who's seen the show knows that we definitely, we lean in, we don't lean away, but we definitely try to have that every week we try to have, well, it could have been this but it really feels like it's probably this. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Ah, such a great show. I mean, I'm just reliving it in my mind that, you know, as you're speaking. Um, and I think, you know, just to sort of bring our sort of, you know, interview portion of our experience today to a, a conclusion, you know, the thing that really stands out for me is that, you know, you're somebody, and I can attest to this, that for years had a, a fascination and interest and, and, you know, something that really turned you on and you were able to, not only be able to explore that, but get paid to explore that and in a very public way, like taking thousands, I guess, even millions of people on that journey with you. Right. So right. for our listeners, specifically the people that are interested in, in this topic, you know, this internal leverage, like, and, and what we were talking about before about resiliency, was there ever times when you were like, Oh, this is, this is BS. Like who's going to listen to this and who am I to write this? And if so, like, what in those moments did you tap into in order to ov overcome that to achieve your dream? Yeah. Oh, man, what a great question. I mean, listen, first of all, I'll say that, like, all the time, I mean, even now, you know, when things I'm working on, you know, I think it's just the nature of when you put yourself out there of any artistry, any sort of creative expression, you know, you second guess yourself, <laughs> you know, like, you're like, uh, and I, and like, listen, like I've had success, right. I've had a show on television that went two seasons, like for, you know, over 2 million people watch it every week, which is still something I'm like, Oh my God, I can't believe that happened. Um, but you know, but then it's like the show ends and it's like onto the, onto the next one. But yeah, I mean, like there were, there were, you know, in each, in each one is I think the journey of discovery and, and risk and all that kind of stuff. I think there's a few things that I always, I think that I, that I did do that I didn't realize that I was doing along the way that I think, that I think were helpful. And like, one of the big ones I think was I, and this is, and this is like, I think like I was hard on myself, but I was easy on myself. I was hard on myself. And then I was constantly like, I need to be doing more. I need to, you know, I, you know, I need to, uh, you know, why hasn't this happened for me yet or whatever. I, I was constantly pushing, pushing, pushing and trying to, you know, and, and some of that stuff I think is was helpful. You know, even like, honestly, even things like jealousy, like reading, you know, seeing, seeing somebody else who I knew like sell a script was like, was like a motivator for me. Like, I actually like, like, I, I like I, I was in some respects a jealous person, like, but I think I found a way to be like, I got, I'm going to do this too. I'm going to work, 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 work. But at the same time, I was sort of hard on myself. And, and I know that that's like, 
that's not like that's necessarily like an like, like a, a pretty aspect of of it but it was it's an ugly aspect of anything and i've become less that way with time but like it's a, it's a truthful thing um but the other thing i will say is that i um I, uh, I think I was pretty good at, uh, at also patting myself on the back or rewarding myself and having some pride in, in a small accomplishment, like, um, or in a relatively small accomplishment. Like, I'll be honest, like, I think the feeling I got when I had a script place, my very first, not my very first script, but my very first script that placed in any kind of screenplay competition, I had a screenplay that, that placed in the Nickel Fellowship. It was a quarter finalist and never moved on from there. I honestly think that that feeling, that first sense, that was the first time I'd ever been validated by sort of an outside anybody. And I had submitted scripts to the Nickel Fellowship before that, but you know, that like, okay, like there's, there's maybe I, maybe I, you know, I kind of took that feeling with me to some degree. And I think that that feeling in some ways was more important than like when I, when I got the phone call, like, hey, we're gonna do 10 episodes of Project Blue Book and I'm in New York standing on Broadway, like, oh my God. I think I was just, you know, so I think it's, I, I, this is a long-winded way of me saying that I think it's, 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 I think it's good and I think it's, 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 it's valuable to like reward yourself for the accomplishments you do have. Like, and then also like making, I, I'm, I, I sort of try to set small deadlines for myself. Like, okay, today I'm just going to like focus on the log, the, like the log line of my project, really try to make that work and really spend some time on it and, 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 and sort of create this authentic relationship with yourself of like having a goal even if it's a small writer's goal or whatever it is and then trying to accomplish it so that so that you're like you're in authenticity with yourself or like I set out to do something today and I'm going to do it and or, or like setting small deadlines but like reasonable deadlines not like I need to write a script this week you know like you know scripts take months months and months right, right. but it's just like today I'm going to write one page you know and like or I'm going to work on it every day, even if it's literally just like typing a word and being like, okay, I did it today. Those right. kinds of acts. That's how I finished my first script, by the way, was I wrote every single day. And there were those days where I was just like, oh my God, it's a Saturday. I'm going to go out and I'm not going to work. But I would sit down and be like, write one sentence and be like, okay, I worked today. Gone. Right. And those kinds of things I think really help. But it's like being kind on yourself, celebrating even small victories and setting reasonable deadlines that I, that I think you can hit. And commitment too. Commitment. Yeah. Commitment. And, and, following and just through. following through. Yeah. Following through. Absolutely. And, um, and, uh, and there's a sort a certain sense of like, I think in a good way, a sense of like, when you're working on something, I don't like to talk too much about things when I'm working on them. I like to, I, I get empowered by the sense of like, I have, I have a secret nobody knows about. Yet. I get empowered by that like that's how I play poker like I'm horrible I'm horrible when I don't have anything like I'm not good at bluffing and then when I don't have anything but I am good at pretending I don't have anything when I have like what they call like the nuts or, <laughs> or like you know what I mean like yeah. um uh and I and and I I like coming from a place of like I have a secret and so that's something I remember thinking about a lot when I was teaching was I, I enjoyed teaching quite a bit, but I obviously had ambitions to be a screenwriter. And, and I remember I would, I would every, I, I taught for seven years and I swear to God, every day I would be like, or every, every year I'd be like, I have a secret and nobody knows this yet, but this is the year that I'm not going to be teaching anymore because this is the year like a show is going to happen. And by the way, I was wrong on, on multiple other things that I tried to sell, but I, that I never gave up on that, on that sort of feeling of like, I ha like, I, I don't know how else to say it. It's just sort of like, I think it's I think it's empowering to like to hold your work in in that regard for yourself of, in that kind of place of like treat it like a treat it like a like a like a little secret that you're gonna and then you gotta share it with the world eventually but like you know treat it treat it with that sort of respect and that sort of excitement I guess beautiful I love that I mean you know you covered so many things that I certainly talk about with with my clients around setting. Uh, goals that are not so big that you burn yourself out, but that you can reward yourself and celebrate all along the way, because that's really the growth mindset, which is the mindset of a high performer, as opposed to the fixed mindset, which is I'm leaving from New York tonight. If I don't get to LA by tomorrow morning, then <laughs> like I'm a, I'm a worthless right. piece of nothing. Right. It's like, you got to pace right. yourself. Right. And, and use the goal as, as trail markers to make sure that you're still on the same, on the right path. Right. And so you, you just, you know, with your story, your, your career, your journey, you, you've exemplified that. So 
So that's that's really beautiful. So uh, just you know, from internal leverage, I just want to say thanks for for being on the show and and sharing your journey with us. And really appreciate you know, obviously your friendship. I mean, you know that. But uh, but then also you know every everything that you shared with us and and really wishing you all the best moving forward.